You are listening to the podcast of Calvary Church in Irwin, Pennsylvania. For more information, you can visit us online at calvaryirwin.com. Uh, before we jump into God's Word, real quick, today is the last message in a series we've been talking about this month called The Dawn is Rising. Next week, we're starting a brand new series called The Safest Place on Earth. And The Safest Place on Earth, uh, this whole series is following a book uh, loosely by Larry Crabb. And uh, we live in a world and, and uh, find ourselves in a society where relationships are so difficult. We're all uh, running from one thing to the next. Our schedules are full. We're packed. We've got so much happening. And oftentimes what happens is the relationships we do have are so surface, so minuscule. And uh, we see outlined in Scripture is this community that God has created, a spiritual community that meets our deepest longing and need as human beings. And it's the longing and need for deep, meaningful relationships, for people with which we can walk through the journey of life, through the difficulties and the struggles, and have someone that's there to support us and pray for us and encourage us and lift us up when we're down. And over the next month, we're gonna be talking about this safest place on earth that God has created called the church. This is our role, this is why we're here. We are to be that for our world. So we're gonna be walking through that over the next month, and I hope you can join us next week as we uh, we kick that off, talking about spiritual community. Now, uh, before we we jump into God's word, why don't you uh, turn to the person next to you and say, I'm excited to be here. Can you do that? If you're sitting in one of the shelters or or watching a line today, let someone know you're excited to be here, you're excited to be part of this today. I'm excited. Uh, When I was in high school, near the end of the 90s, that's when I was, I graduated in 2000 from high school. Um, If that seems like that was a lot longer than you thought, uh, you can just, in your mind, I graduated in 2015. And we'll, we'll go with that too. Um, but uh, late 90s, um, I would go to this family camp uh, and my cousins were there oftentimes. My, my one cousin, Rich, uh, late 90s, would listen to this song when we were going to sleep at night. And he was like listening to it on repeat and it would drive me up a wall, but it kind of sticks in your head. It was by this little known rapper named Colio. Have any of you ever heard of Colio? Uh, a few of you have, okay. Um, well, in 1997, he released this song called See You When You Get There. Um, it's this song that has kind of this uh, chorus that just kind of goes on repeat and gets stuck in your head. Uh, and, and it was a pretty popular song. And uh, wh- what's interesting about this song, See You When You Get There, is it covered a topic in, that wasn't really popular, isn't really popular to discuss in the rap industry, which is the afterlife. And, and if you have heard the song, you can Google it later or, or look on Spotify, but it has this unmistakable chorus uh, where it speaks of this hope and it says, I'll see you when you get there. If you ever get there, I'll see you when you get there. And, and it's talking about like what happens after we die. And while this topic is pretty unique for a rap song, Uh, the curiosity about the future and specifically the afterlife isn't really that unique. In fact, uh, human beings have been processing, exploring, and trying to figure out what this looks like since the beginning of mankind. And I don't know if you've ever wondered this yourself. Like, what happens after you die? Like, what affects what happens after you die? And there's a lot of speculations about this. Most of the major world religions believe that there is some form of judgment after death uh, but that's where things start to go in different directions. For, for Hindus and, and Buddhists, they believe that after judgment that we are reincarnated. For, for Christians or Jews and Muslims, uh, there's this belief that there's some form of heaven and hell. Movies have even jumped into the mix trying to explore the wonders of the afterlife. And more often than not, they focus more on guests, ghosts or, or premonitions of, of loved ones who have passed on or, or, or the beauty of the angelic. And, and there have been some pretty big movies like Sixth Sense or Dogma or Michael that have done really well in the box office. But I believe they did well not simply because they were good storylines, but also because they fed our curiosity with this future afterlife. Now, this isn't usually a topic that many of us will sit down uh, and discuss over the dinner table or grab coffee with a friend and talk about. What I've found is that the afterlife becomes more of a topic of discussion between close friends, usually when a loved one is lost or, or when a person is faced with their own mortality because of a, a near-death experience or a difficult diagnosis. And I've done hundreds of, of funerals and have walked loved ones through many of the things that maybe you've thought about when you've lost a parent 
or a sibling or someone close to you. Questions like, what really happens after we die? Is there the possibility to someday be reunited with this person I care so much about? Is, is, is there, uh, uh, you know, certain things that I'm doing now that can affect where I'm going and what's going to happen after I die? And these are real life questions that, that we process. And, and I wanna dive into some of those questions here in our brief time t- together this morning. And, and really the big question we wanna tackle today is this. What is heaven like and how can I get there? What is heaven like and how can I get there? You, you see, it's not just about what the afterlife looks like, but, but are there things that we can do now that affect what happens then, later? Now, now throughout this month, we've been talking about the dawn is rising and, and this hope that we can all possess in Jesus. And, and one of the greatest hopes that early believers held to in the first century, and is still, still really a, a hope that we possess today, is something Paul referred to in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. He called the blessed hope. And, and if you've not heard that term before, the blessed hope is this, this, this uh, anticipation of Christ's second coming. You might be like, what does that even mean? Well, Christ's first coming took place when he was born to Mary and Joseph on that cool evening in Bethlehem, what we celebrate at Christmas time. And, and throughout his ministry here on earth, Jesus would often refer to his second coming, the, the time that he would return for what we refer to as the rapture of the church, where, where the church would be taken to heaven. And, and the events of the second coming are referenced throughout uh, numerous books of the Bible, including Daniel and, and, and the Gospels, First and Second Thessalonians, uh, the book of, of, of Revelation. Uh, one of the focal points of the second coming is really surrounding uh, believers being taken to heaven. Believers who are still alive being taken to heaven. And, and while I, we won't go into all the specifics uh, of this throughout Christian history, this view of what that heaven, that place we're being taken to, looks like has, has changed. As we've more clearly understood scripture and what was intended uh, when heaven was spoken of, we've, we've, we've adjusted and changed. And early, our Eastern Orthodox Christians, they perceive heaven as, as having different levels, the lowest of those being paradise. The Catholic Church teaches us that heaven is the ultimate end and fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme definitive happiness. So uh, if you kind of misinterpret that, you could think, well, heaven is just like whatever I love. Maybe you've thought that before. Like whatever I love, that's gonna be heaven for me. Like for me, heaven might be like a touch of Taco Bell with a lot of Chipotle. Like that's, that's rich man's Taco Bell, okay? Um, or, 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 you know, maybe for you, like heaven is like 24-7 sports and the Steelers always win. They never lose. Big Ben never loses. That's heaven for you. What, whatever it looks like, if we take that to an extreme that heaven is just like pure happiness for us, we could think, well, heaven is built around what I like, like my preferences. The, the Protestant church has had a variety of views on, on heaven, but most uh, denominations, most Protestant churches teach that, that a person enters heaven uh, upon uh, the moment of their death. And, and with such a variety of views, it can be confusing. We can think like, well, what are you supposed to believe? And, and, and beyond that, does this really even matter? Like, what does it matter if, if I think heaven is this or that? Like, that's that. We'll figure that out when we get there. But, but you know, what, what's, what does it matter? Well, our view of heaven matters because how we view the end affects how we pursue it. Uh, author Stephen Covey famously uh, wrote these words that we should begin with the end in mind. And, you know, I don't think that principle is simply for uh, us to, to be better employees at work or to help us tackle a project more effectively. It's a really healthy approach to how we live our lives. And if we are to begin with the end in mind, I want to look at what the end actually looks like. And, and can we even be certain about the end as, it, as it's supposed to be? Or is it, is it something that's just always going to be this mystery that we'll never have an idea of? Jesus, in his teaching, we see in the Gospels, in the second part of the Bible, the, the New Testament, and the Gospels are the first four books of that New Testament, Jesus recognized the mystery of heaven, the mystery of the afterlife. And, and while he didn't give us all the details of heaven, he ultimately gave us what we needed. And, and the information Jesus shared about heaven was given with a certain uh, premise in mind. And if you don't understand this premise, his teaching on heaven might seem almost incomplete, like he's, he's missing out on some things. Now, but Jesus wasn't trying to communicate all the detail or information. Instead, he was trying to communicate hope. 
So his, his teaching on heaven wasn't just to give you all the dirty detail of what heaven's gonna look like, but, but to help us possess hope. And here's the basic premise of Jesus' teaching and really uh, the scope of scripture on this idea or understanding of heaven. It's that heaven isn't about our rewards or riches. It's about the redemption of sin and mankind. Maybe you've always thought like, heaven is my reward. I just need to make, do what I need to do so I can get this reward of heaven. But that's not the intent of scripture. That's not the intent of heaven. It's not about a reward. It's, out of, it's actually about the redemption of sin and mankind. You see, from the very beginning of creation, when sin entered the world, God has been working to redeem the world. In other words, all of scripture, all of human history isn't building toward like this magical moment where we stand uh, around in these big white robes and just sing worship songs forever. Where it's just like a constant loop of worship and that's all we do. Uh, But for the entirety of human history, God has been working toward the ultimate restoration of what sin has taken from the world. That's God's intent of heaven. And, and, And just listen to what Jesus said about heaven in the Gospels. And what he intends for heaven. It's recorded uh, in John chapter 14, verse 1. Here's what Jesus said. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And he's speaking of heaven here. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Now, we often interpret this verse as God is building mansions for us in the sky. I don't know if you've heard that before, that thought. Like, heaven is just like streets of mansions, and he's building us a mansion. And, and maybe if you've been around church uh, long enough, you remember the old hymn of the church. Some of you probably could sing this. Uh, I won't, you know, ruin your ears by singing it for you, but uh, the, the words of this old hymn are, are so telling. It says, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder, we'll never more wander, but walk on streets of purest gold. What a great song. Now we've historically had this understanding of heaven being filled with mansions, really coming from the the King James translation of this one verse here in John chapter 14. In the King James version, it says this, in my father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and that translation there of mansion, we have taken that and we've you know, broadened it and said, well, that must be what heaven is just about mansions. It's about big rewards. But we have better translated these verses now in, in modern times, in today's English, and we now understand this verse to speak of rooms in our heavenly Father's home, not mansions. And this is important because Jesus isn't speaking of riches and rewards. He's speaking of a restored relationship with our Heavenly Father. This is what he's getting at. And and if you read from Genesis to Revelation, God's goal isn't to get us riches and rewards. It's to restore what sin has taken. And and let me read this again, these verses in the New International Version. Uh, and, And look at the relational language that Jesus is using here, okay? We'll walk through this. John chapter 14, verse one. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Listen to this. Believe also in me. There's a relational connection there. Believe also in me. Verse two. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Once again, he's talking about the relationship that he has with us. Verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Jesus isn't talking about the reward and the riches. He's talking about the relationship that he's restoring. Why is this shift important for understanding of heaven? Because heaven isn't about our rewards or riches. It's about the redemption of sin and mankind. Jesus in these verses speaks of the redemption or the restoration of this relationship we have with our creator, with God, that he is making it possible. 
In Matthew's record of the gospel, Jesus would pray this prayer that has famously become known as the Lord's Prayer. And you've probably heard it at some point, whether it be at a funeral or in a church service. And and, and right in the middle of this, this prayer that's part of the Sermon on the Mount, this big sermon message that Jesus shares in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, this prayer called the Lord's Prayer, he makes this statement. Here's what Jesus prayed. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This incredible prayer that Jesus is praying, right in the middle of it, he like highlights this idea. He said, God, this is my prayer. Father, heavenly Father, that that your will would be done, your kingdom would come on earth just as it is in heaven. Through this prayer, Jesus was speaking of the hope that we can experience glimpses of heaven here on earth. Isn't that remarkable? That, that, that heaven isn't just this afterlife experience that we have to earn and, and, and work our way toward and one day we get to experience the beauty of heaven but that we can get glimpses of it here on earth. And, and this is such a fascinating prayer, not just because of what Jesus prayed for but really because of how he lived it out. Like this is what I loved about Jesus. He didn't just pray things. He wasn't just some religious figure that like, would just throw things out there and say, there you go, guys. No, he would actually practically model it and live it out. In fact, read this. Uh, Jesus, uh, later in the, in, the, in the New Testament, the second part of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, we're given this amazing picture of heaven and what heaven's supposed to look like. And, and as, as we read through this uh, in Revelation 21, uh, notice how Jesus, his life was actively bringing pieces of what we see described in Revelation 21 here to earth through his ministry. And here's what's amazing. He didn't just do it, but he asks us to do it as well. Here's what it says in Revelation 21, starting in verse three. Yeah, we read, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell. What does that say? What's those last two words? With them, with them. Uh, If you're not a student of scripture, or maybe this is all new to you, in in the Matthew's gospel, one of the the themes throughout Matthew's gospel, his telling of the story of Jesus, is this idea that Jesus was called Emmanuel, God with us. In fact, early on in the Christmas story, the story of Jesus, we were told that Jesus was going to be Emmanuel, God with us. At the end of Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 28, uh, as Jesus is giving the great commission, he's saying, go into all the world, preach the gospel. At the end of it, he says, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. There's this concept that Jesus is with us. Jesus was fulfilling this. He said, and he will dwell with them. Jesus was that. And and it goes on. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and and be their God. Paul later writes that Jesus, that through Jesus, we are adopted as sons and daughters into his family. That through Christ's sacrifice, we actually get to be considered God's family. Like we take on his name, talking about what we see there. In verse four, he says, and he will wipe away every tear From their eyes, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the order, old order of things has passed away. Jesus, throughout his ministry, exercised the miraculous. He healed the sick, he raised the dead. He literally was fulfilling this promise and this commitment to bring heaven to earth. And and what's amazing is he wouldn't stop there. Like, Jesus could be the superhero, and he would just do it all, and we'd be like, wow. Jesus was amazing. Let's strive to be like Jesus, knowing that we can never be like Jesus because he was the son of God. But John chapter 14, that verse I read a few minutes ago uh, where he's talking about the rooms that he's preparing, just a few verses later in John 14, verse 12, Jesus makes this really crazy statement. I don't know if you have like a crazy friend that throws out some statements and you're like, what are you thinking? Maybe if you don't, you're probably that crazy friend, okay? Um, <laughs> Nudge your, nudge your neighbor and say, I'm your crazy friend. You can do it. Scott, you don't have a friend next to you, but you're the crazy friend. I'm just telling you. It's part of your latrobe blood that runs through your body. Um, John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus makes this crazy statement. Here's what, here's what he says. He said, whoever believes in me, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. I want to put a period there. Imagine he put a period. Uh, 
Jesus is saying, if you believe in me, you can do what I'm doing. That's crazy. Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave. Jesus uh, caused, uh, prayed for the, the sick, the blind, the lame, and they would walk and they would see. And like Jesus did some amazing miracles. He walked on water. He did some crazy stuff. And Jesus is now saying to his disciples, for those who believe me, he wasn't just saying for you disciples, for you apostles, for like those that have the right title. He's saying, I don't know if you, you, you read that. It says, whoever, whoever isn't like whoever I choose. It's whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, comma, and they will do even, what's that word there? Even what? Greater things than these. Now Jesus is like blowing my mind. Like this is insane that Jesus would say this. So here's the deal. When we're reading Revelation 21, this picture of heaven and Jesus is the fulfillment of this and like he's bringing these glimpses of heaven to earth and, and he's practicing this God with us, Emmanuel. How he's, he's, he's basically helping people recognize they're part of the family of God, like they're adopted and, and how he's bringing this, this, this concept that there is no tears and, and there's no sorrow and there's no death and there's no sickness that, that Jesus can actually heal people and restore what's been lost because of sin. He didn't just do that. He actually puts that on us now and says, you know what, you can do that. There's this idea of, of the incarnation of Jesus in John chapter one says that, 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 that the word, speaking of Jesus, dwelt among us. We have beheld his glory. Like this incredible idea. Well, the, the incarnation of Jesus is now you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth, as Jesus said. He's empowered you to do what he started. That, that you can be Jesus in the midst of a world. That you can help people feel connected and adopted. That it's not it's not about beating people over the head with your Bible so that they hear your doctrine and, and they hear your teaching. It's about building a longer table and inviting them to the table so they can be part of the family. Do you hear me? This is what he's called us to do. This is the glimpse and picture of heaven. It, and, it, and it's not just that Jesus had this magic touch, like he had the Midas touch, like everything he touched was healed. No, no, he's given us the Holy Spirit that that we can do that. You know like that coworker that's, that's struggling? You know you can pray for them and God could heal them. You, not someone with a, a, a pastor before their name or a reverend before their name, not, not someone with the, you know, the, 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 all the initials on, uh, at the end of their name, they have all these masters or doctorates or, or they've studied all this stuff and they're scholarly and all of that. No, you, he said whoever believes, not whoever has the credentials or the education or the experience. Whoever believes that we get to be part of bringing heaven to earth because heaven isn't about our rewards. It's not about our riches. Heaven is about the redemption of sin and mankind. That's what God is working toward. Back to Matthew chapter six, after the Lord's prayer, uh, Jesus uh, is mentioning heaven again in this Sermon on the Mount, in verse 19 of Matthew 6. He says, it's, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, but where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Once again, we interpret this as a statement we're speaking to our rewards, but when you look at the entire chapter of Matthew 6 uh, in the context of what Jesus is sharing, he's not talking about accumulating or gathering. He's ultimately talking about our posture to those around us, that we're there to serve them, that we're to help people. He's saying that we tend to focus on accumulating stuff on earth that we feel has value. But what we have has far less value than when we serve others. In other words, it is far more valuable for followers of Jesus to work toward the restoration of God's creation and mankind by helping others and serving them and by bringing glimpses of heaven here on earth. When, when you take time to listen to that coworker as they walk through one of the most painful situations in their life, when you go out of your way to help that older person get the groceries in their car, <clears throat> when you take those precious moments on your drive to work, turn on some music and just take time to worship Jesus by yourself, in each of those moments, you're not just making the world better or making yourself better. You're actually bringing heaven one step closer to earth. One of the most unique and fascinating things Jesus teaches about heaven is found in a story that some 
referred to as a parable. It's recorded in Luke chapter 16. This is one of the only, one of the only parables that Jesus shares, if it is a parable, that addresses the afterlife. It's also the only one where Jesus provides for us the proper names of the actual people involved in the story. There are a lot of questions and speculation around this story without diving into all that detail. Uh, I, I gives us one of these amazing glimpses of the afterlife, not just heaven, but also the alternative, hell. In Luke chapter 16, verse 22, here's, here's what it says. <clears throat> the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. <clears throat> the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So you have these two guys, a wealthy man and, and Lazarus, who's a beggar. Uh, Lazarus, the beggar, he goes to Abraham's side, which is uh, referencing heaven, essentially. And, and the, the wealthy man goes to Hades, which is hell. Verse 24. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And beside all of this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to there cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, father, send Lazarus to my family for I have five brothers. Let them warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. There's some, uh, we could talk for hours on this, this passage, but here's the, the basic things I wanna share. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And we have this amazing opportunity to point people toward heaven. It's not about what we accumulate, not that accumulating things is bad, but it's about what we do with it. It's about what we do with what we've been given. It's about what we do with what God has empowered us with and equipped us with and, and blessed us with. What Jesus is stressing here isn't that we need to be obsessed with heaven or even how can we get to heaven. After all, he made it pretty clear our way to heaven, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But what he's focusing on is that we should live our lives in the context of heaven, recognizing beginning with the end in mind, meaning that we aren't to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Instead, we should be so heavenly minded that we bring heaven's goodness to earth. And, and the question is, well, why, why is this even important? Because when we view heaven as simply a reward for our efforts on earth, we can end up living a life with a very self-serving approach, meaning we might do good things, <clears throat> even be obedient to what Jesus asks of us, but it's ultimately with a self-serving reward in mind, which puts us as the focal point of the entire story. But what Jesus teaches and what we read throughout scripture is that we aren't the center of the story. All of scripture, the entire story of God's work here on earth has one continuous thread woven throughout it from beginning to end. It's the thread of God's redemption, of God redeeming a broken world. <clears throat> Do a fascinating thing here on your own time. Read the book of Genesis chapter one, two, and three and then read Revelation and, and, the, and the story and the description of what heaven will look like. You'll notice a few things when you compare the two. <clears throat> There's similarities. Eden and heaven have so many overlapped similarities. Why is that? It was like God bored, he's not creative. He's just like hitting repeat. No, it's called redemption. It, God has been working to redeem what sin has stolen, what, what the brokenness of our world has brought about. The story of God's redemption isn't about getting us big mansions, or more treasures. That's not the story uh, of God's redemption. That story is about us being part of this seemingly impossible restoration project. It's a project that so many have given up on throughout the years, but God has never given up on it. It's the restoration of a broken, fallen, often ugly world. God isn't waiting for heaven, but he's calling us to bring heaven to earth. He's calling us to be part of the healing, the restoration, the redemption of this world. We don't have to wait until we physically die to experience this. We get to start here and now. In fact, God, Paul would, <clears throat> would write about our connection to heaven in some of his epistles. As the worship team comes today in Philippians chapter three, <clears throat> verse 20, we read this, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power 
that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. <clears throat> Paul here in Philippians 3 is talking about how we are transformed into this image of Christ, this glorious image of Christ, and that our citizenship, our end goal isn't to be a citizen of heaven, but of earth, but of heaven. We don't live in a way that is reflective of our current residence, or, 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 but, but of the residence that we hope for, the residence of heaven. And here's the deal, we find our meaning, our purpose, our reason for being, not simply in our ultimate destination, or not simply in the stops along the way, but in our ultimate destination, that, that our reason for being, our purpose, is in what God is doing, not just how he's getting us there. Paul explained practically how this happens. We don't have to wait till we physically die to experience the glory, grandeur, and beauty of heaven. That when you breathe your last, that's the first time you're gonna step into heaven. But as Jesus said, as we die to ourselves daily, as we offer ourselves to God in worship, we become this magnificent reflection of the glory of God through our lives here on earth. And here's what Paul would write to the church in Rome in Romans chapter 12, verse one. He said, therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, he was writing this to a church in Rome that saw the pagan religions of the world being worshiped around them where they offered sacrifices, often even infant sacrifices. And Paul was saying, no, no, no. The goal isn't to sacrifice something dead for the sake of your God. The goal is to offer your very self for the sake of your God. A living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. A living, breathing sacrifice. He goes on in verse two. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, we are part of a greater world, a greater kingdom. We have a heavenly destination. We're not, we don't have to be part and conform to this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul is talking about heaven. What is his will, his ultimate purpose? So as we exercise this proper worship, we are transformed into this glorious expression of heaven. And that's through our singing and worship that we did a minute ago, we're gonna do it here in a minute, but also through our serving those around us, even our sharing of the hope that we possess with those that don't have it. Near the end, near the end of the book of Revelation, which it's called Revelation because it was a revelation of what was yet to come, given to the apostle John on the island of Patmos. And as God is revealing all this to John in the first century, he's and he's recording, God makes this really profound statement that John records in Revelation 21.5. He says this, this is what John writes. He who is seated on the throne said this, and that's speaking of God, I am making everything new. And this has been and continues to be God's ultimate goal. He didn't say, I did make everything new, like in past tense. He also didn't say, I will make everything new, like future tense. He said, I am making everything new, present tense. He's making everything new. Heaven isn't about our rewards or our riches, it's about the redemption of sin and mankind. And, and here's why we're talking so much about heaven today. Yeah, it's true that we don't know the day or the hour that we're gonna breathe our last. That could be today or tomorrow. We should live though with each day, we should live each day that we're given with eternity in mind. And beyond that, we have this incredible privilege and opportunity with every breath and every step to bring heaven a little closer to earth. Think about this for a second. You are the closest thing most people in your workplace, in your neighborhood or your school will ever experience of heaven. You are the closest they may ever get to heaven. Give them the most beautiful, most incredible picture of heaven you can. And my question to you is, what are you practically doing to bring heaven to earth? Are you cultivating a heart and a posture of worship every day? Worship is such an incredible opportunity to transform our minds and our hearts when we take time to sing, to worship. You don't have to have a team like we're gonna have here in a minute. 
You can just put some music on. You don't even have to have music on, just by yourself. Are you cultivating a posture of worship in your life? Are you cultivating the atmosphere of heaven right here on earth? To see the results of heaven, you have to cultivate the culture of heaven in your life. Are you looking to serve the least of these by giving them a glimpse of this place that we read about in Revelation, where he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, where there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. Are you helping people experience glimpses of that? That's what we're called to do. And, 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 the, and the truth is, we can never help the world experience that if we aren't cultivating a culture of worship, a culture of heaven in us. We've all experienced plenty of people who are so-called Christians that are some of the meanest, most difficult people you'll ever meet because they're trying to live according to the letter of the law without cultivating the culture of heaven in their hearts. It's what it means in, Revelation, or in Romans 12, that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we don't conform to the pattern of this world. No, we're, we're conforming to a pattern of a world that is far greater, the pattern of heaven, that we're cultivating, we're, we're, we're facilitating this culture of worship. And today, if you can stand with me, we wanna take a minute to do that. Heaven, as I mentioned, isn't just about, you know, us standing in white robes and worshiping Jesus the rest of our lives. But there's an, if you read throughout Revelation, there is a, a, a context of worship that prevails and pervades throughout all of heaven. We're not gonna get into like logistics here, but, but heaven, if you read the new heaven, new earth, Heaven isn't like this special, it's, it's earth restored. It's us living in the world that God originally planned in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Like, this is what God created. It's God redeeming what has been broken and lost. And if we can cultivate a heart of worship, we get to, to bring little glimpses of that restored world and life to the world that so desperately needs it around us. So we're gonna take a minute and not just rush out of here because we have things to do. We're gonna take a minute and cultivate that in our lives. You don't have to get, we have, we're, gonna, we're not gonna be here forever. But in these moments, I just want you, between you and God, to spend some time saying, God, how can you transform me into this picture of heaven that my world needs? In worship, God, transform me by the renewing of my mind. Transform my heart that might be distant or broken, hurting. Transform me that I could be part of transforming the world around me. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, even as we worship this morning in these brief moments, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would move in us. God, remind us that you are with us. You aren't distant from us. God, remind us that you are empowering us, that you have adopted us as sons and daughters. And God, that we can cultivate this heart of worship, this place of worship, this, this posture of worship everywhere we go bringing heaven to earth. Let's sing this song together this morning. This is Pastor Nick Pohl, the lead pastor at Calvary. We're so glad you joined us for today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed the message. At Calvary Church, we're passionate about leading people into an overflowing life with Jesus. We would love the opportunity to connect with you on your faith journey and hear what God is doing in your life or join you in prayer for any needs you might have. You can visit us online at calvaryirwin.com or send us an email at info at calvaryirwin.com. On our website, you'll find previous week's messages, a list of upcoming events, as well as resources designed to help you take those next steps on your journey of faith. See you next week, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. 